body, wherever you go, wherever you pick up the MR, you have to go through similar principles. In spine, the only difference is that the images which we do are sagittal images, which I'll show you along. Then we do axial images. These are the two images sequences. The third one is the coronal sequence, which you might have seen in shoulder scans and knee scans. But in spine, we don't do coronal sequences. We do coronal only when we aim for localize how to do the spine imaging. So you may have some what they call it as a scout images. So a good principle any time in life, if anybody shows you, show you MRI scans or CT scan, always try, or even if you don't do it, tell the examiner that I will look for the localizer or I will look for the scout images. Whenever you report any scans in life, the reason is that sometime you will pick up pathologies on that scout images, which are known as initial planning images at the time of scans, which are done to define the level of scans, which the radiographer or the technician will do. Then coming to the MR sequences for spine, so as I said, we have SAG image, axial images. Now in SAG, we do T1, T2, and the T1 is principally done for, to look for anatomy and to look the marrow. T2 is done for cord and nerve pathology. Then same, we do axial T2, in which we cross-reference our axial levels with the SAG levels, that where the problem in the cord is, and the nerve. Following this, if the history is for any infection, inflammation, or tumor, in that scenario, we need to look for SAG stir images, which is very, very important. So sometimes you might have come across in MCQs, these type of basic MR uh, questionnaires, where they would ask to rule out any one sequence where you want to co confirm your findings from T1 or T2, you will tell that we will do infection, inflammation, and tumor for stir sequences. It's very important. And then post-operatively and in tumor, you will also add a sequence of axial T1 and axial T1 plus contrast. Is it okay so far? Yes, sir, it is clear. Yeah, any questions? There's already 10 people joined you like Sorry, sir? So I'm going to record this. So when you finish, I'll give everybody a copy of, of people who hasn't haven't joined or didn't have time to come and join in yet. Oh yes, anytime, no problem, sir. Yeah, that's fine. I can what is tear is stand for? Movie, sir. Sorry. What is tear is stand for? S T I R. Oh, so you are asking? Is, I think the short tall in recovery or something. I am not. You can't catch me on that. I don't remember it. But it's commonly known as tear sequence and that's what it is you can google it very easily what is tur in some centers it's not even called stir it's trim t-r-i-m depending on the technique of or the or the physics of the machine which they have applied so but you you do stir sequences for as i said the key is to know that stir sequences are done for infection inflammation and tumors okay so we move across then to the next slide the another very important thing whenever you see an sagittal imaging first you have to identify the left the transitional vertebra is there any transitional vertebra and so the way if i am reporting a scan i will always look for the bottom most complete disc so i don't know if you can see my cursor on the screen so my report on in second or third line will always say that i'm counting the level from the lower most complete disc is between for example, I take this L5, this vertebra, and this one S1. So I, I put a note in the report saying that my on my report, it says that the lowermost complete disc is considered as L5 slash S1. And then I usually give them a number as well, because if surgeon wants to operate at a certain level, and if I have not counted or if I've not taken, taken notice of this transitional vertebra, then chances are that he may operate on the wrong level. So it's always important that you look for the changes. So you can, that's one way of saying it. The other could be that when you see the low most vertebra, see if that vertebra has taken either the form of sacral. So is it a sacral vertebra which has lumbricalized, means like it's behaving or is the body is more thickened and it looks like lumbar vertebra. Or sometimes you will see L5 vertebra which looks like sacralized sort of like. But to keep it simple, you always start from the lower most complete disc. And once you are satisfied, you then tell the, on your report that I'm considering this 
at L5 S1. So when you give a nerve level or root impingement at certain level higher up, the surgeon will know and he will be at the same pitch that we both are, we both know what, which level you are talking. That's always important if you are given a MR scan, always look for transitional vertebra. And even if you are not looking in your report or in your, sorry, discussion, you can say that I will look for this. So then this orthopedic surgeon examining oh. you will know that this patient, this person know that there's a transition vertebra or not. He does have a concept of it because it's very important in surgery to identify the correct levels. Is this clear to everyone? Yes, yeah, it is clear. Okay, good. It is basically the reference point. Yes, that's very important in surgery, either for injections or for the level of surgery to be done. So next, I'm just going to go through some video of, again, this is sagittal images. So in spine, we are looking at this patient from side, okay? So we need two sequences in spine, sagittal, which is you are looking now, and axial is when you look like a kicking, a, like cutting a sleece, uh, Swiss cheesecake or something, like a roll, you know? If you have a, like a bun or big burger and you are slicing it, that's like an axial, and this is sagittal. So you're looking at this body from side. And the, so the first thing to look for in this sequence will be, first of all, see if the CSF, so for look into the bones, I'll tell you everything, but to see the CSF, which is important, if it is bright, it means that's a T2 sequence. Or if it is a stir sequence, I'll show you later if I have a picture here, it will be bright. So if you see the CSF is bright, it's T2 or stir sequence. Yeah. Then if you look into the fat in this one, so if I see the fat, which is bright here, it means it's non-fat suppressed. So the fat is not being suppressed in this sequence. And in stir sequence, the difference will be that the fat will be suppressed in that one, which will be darker, but the CSF will be bright. So if you see a bright CSF with a dark fat on sides, that's the stir sequence. If you see a CSF which is bright and the fat is not suppressed, that's a T2 sequence. This is not a T1 sequence. In T1, you will see dark CSF. And the same principle stands in other body parts as well, where if the joint fluid is there, like in knee or shoulder, and it is bright, so then you end up, it's a T2 sequence. And if it is dark, then it's a T1 sequence. Okay, are we ag agreeing with that? Yes, sir, I agree. Good. Now, and the same, so the other thing, as we said, look at the fluid. So if you look into the D's, this, so these are the discs, that's the vertebral body. And even the disc, you can see bright signal in it. That's a normal hydrated disc because there's fluid in it. If you come at the bottom part, see the disc at the bottom part. So do you see less high signal. In MRI, we talk about high signal or low signal. And you see less high signal at the bottom of the disc. And it, the disc in itself is, is out, is protruded, or is like bulging into the canal. Similarly here, you can see some changes of dehydration there but this center of the disc is still brighter. Yeah. So we scroll through the image from the side and you see, so you can see different anatomy parts. So I understand I'm not here to teach all these anatomy section or do you want to know any anatomy on this to tell you this is the foramina, this is the facet or? Uh, no, sir, we actually know the anatomy. You can continue yes. with the MRI. Continue, okay. So then this is the next sequence which is coming up. And as we discussed, so here, if you see the first thing you notice, the CSF is dark. When the CSF is dark, that's a T1 sequence. Okay. And same is with the disc as well. So if you see the disc are now intermediate grades. So they're just, they're, they're just isotense with the remainder of the disc. It's all intermediate to low signal, which means it's a fluid in it there. And it's not, uh, it's a T1 sequence. So, that's important to pick up. Sometime, I don't know, will you be shown on computer these images or is it the old style of packet films? Uh, it's still old style in Pakistan, sir. Yeah, so then in old style, I think so it's, I've seen some because I'm here, so I, I have seen some with patients. In every scan, there's always in the box, there's written, but I think so it will be too stressful or too small to look for whether it's a T2 or two, T1 or what, which box is what. But with us, it's easy that on, we can scroll it in our PEC system. But with you guys, you have to learn it just by hard ways that it, if CSF is dark, it's a T1 sequence, yeah? 
Okay, sir. And this is the sagittal image. So that's the way we come. So now coming back to the axial. So that's the axial slice which I talked about with some common labeling of these structures which you would see on axial uh, scans. And we can look at, so that's the whole surface where the disc will be sitting and where the disc is sitting, okay? These two are the big source muscles, okay? So source muscle valleys, that's your disc. And you come to the spinal canal, so that's the whole entire space is your spinal canal and with CSF in there. And if this is bright, so then it's a T2 sequence. And usually in our practice, we don't do usually axial T1 until unless it is post-operative or if it is tumorous where we want further anatomy, but it's not routinely done. Routinely, we will do T1, T2, and we will do only axial T2 if it is for nerve root impingements or pathologies. If there is anything to do with inflammation, infection, or tumor, we will add stir sequence to it. So these are the few basic anatomy structures which you can see on axial slice. And then we go to the next slice where, again, we'll go scroll through some of the structures. So again, you can see very nice. That, that's the disc which you are seeing. You are seeing some of the source muscle valleys. We are seeing some nice nerve roots which are coming out into the neural foramen here on both sides. You can nicely see these tiny roots which are the tra trans. So these are traversing nerve roots which are going down and then to come out. And the ones which you are seeing on this screen, these two nice ones, these are the ones which are at the same level. And the another thing to know, I may show if I have scan, I'll show you is the cervical spine and the thoracolumbar spine. So in cervical spine. You are the nerve is coming above the vertebra. So if it is C6 vertebra on the top, it will be C6 nerve root which is exiting. But when you come to C7 vertebra on the top, it will be C7. But under the C7, it's a C8. There's a derm there's a nerve which is known as C8. Okay. So that's the way it works in the cervical. But when you come to thoracolumbar, you are a nerve below. So. If this was image given to me, I can't confirm which level is this. I will always have a sagittal image to look for. So on your hard films in the corner of, if you have practiced some, you will see that there are some dotted marks usually done. Some lines are drawn on the hard films. So if you see an axial slice on an MRI spine, you always cross-reference that box. with At the top, you will have that scout image, which I spoke earlier on. So on your hard films in one corner, you will definitely have slices, dotted line done at that level. So when you look into a box and if it is nine number box, you know that the line number nine on the first corner image is the one which is this level is talking about. Is this clear to you, Satish? Yes, sir, it is clear. Yes, sir, uh, can I ask one question, sir? Any questions, please, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, MRI uh, can be done a plane and with contrast. So yes. when we are ad advising the MRI of spine, suppose in yes. case of uh, a disc herniation, what we yes. should advise, plane or Not with contrast? You, without contrast. So it is very, very few scenarios, if you work in a spine, very few scenarios where you will ask for a MRI spine with contrast. And those are commonly post-operative change because then it's difficult to confirm which tissue is a abnormal tissue or which tissue is like post-operatively. So in post-operative and tumor, you will do contrast, okay? Oh, okay, sir, clear. Other than, other than that, you will hardly use MR. So even for MR shoulder, very few times we will give contrast. MR knee, very few times we will go, we don't routinely do contrast. We only do mostly contrast in spine if you want to look for infection such as post-operative or discitis, for example. Similarly, is with tumor or post-operative. And if we do the other body organs, knee, hips, uh, ankle joints, these are commonly done non-contrast. We don't do contrast commonly. And it's the other way around here because of the in, in Pakistan people, even if you send a patient to have an MR, they will call me back and they argue with me that why should we not give him contrast? I said, I don't need you to give them contrast. Oh, okay, so clear. So co contrast, those are the indications for contrast routinely. Uh, or if the surgeon wants, orthopods or spine surgeon wants, they will discuss with us for contrast. But in tumor, usually soft tissue tumors, we do give contrast. That's a routine. And even to be honest, in those cases, if we have a lump and bump in the body, we scan them first. And then the in-house radiologist will have a quick look. And if it looks like a lipoma or something benign, we don't even give contrast in those cases, to be honest, even if it is a lump and bump. 
but it is something sinister and you have doubt that this may be cancerous other than spine like soft tissue, you can still ask the technician to give them a contrast. Okay? Okay, sir. Clear. Again, these are axial slices. We are going through the lumbosacral spine. Coming back to this. So pathology-wise, these are the common pathologies in common order where which go. So trauma, degenerative infection, tumor, mats, Metabolic bone disease, I've not myself come across where somebody has asked me to do a scan, but incidentally, we see some marrow change, bone marrow, and we may advise them that the marrow looks very, very low signal throughout the spine. Is there any metallurgical or metal metabolic cause to this? And then we leave it to me to further investigate. So I don't know how commonly it is practiced here, but back home, that's the metabolic bone side, which we will usually touch. Other than that, commonly trauma, degenerative changes, very, very common. Degenerative is the one where we do, or infection, tumor, metastases. We go through each of them now, yeah? So in trauma, any principle, always look for these four things. Alignment, if you can check that on a plane film, because in trauma series, if you, you all must be aware for primary survey, secondary survey of trauma in orthopedics, we practice this always, yeah? The same principle states that if you have a trauma scenario, even if it is MRI, you have to tell the clinic, the orthopedic examiner, that I will follow the principle of A, B, C, D, E, which is, you all know that APLS and all the AO uh, management skills, yeah? So coming to a C-spine, if there's a C-spine X-ray, the key is to look for alignment of the patient's neck. And then there are a few lines which I'll go through. And you look for bone, you look for soft tissue, you look for cord and nerve injuries. So alignment, as you might have seen, is anterior uh, alignment, how to look for, see the alignment. If you have any doubt, you can ask the clinician. Usually as a as an orthopod, the radiologist will get in touch with you and say, okay, are you sure? You will either ask them that this is the level I'm thinking he has got neck pain. And then most of these trauma cases in our centers, if there is any suspicious fracture, we will straight away do a C-spine. So C-spine and CT head in routine trauma cases, or even if a trauma is not a, no, not a major trauma, we do them quite regularly just to rule it out. There's no neck injuries, but we do T-spine for that, I means CT scan for it, not um, MRI. MRI is very hardly, poor orthopedics has to push us to do MRI for them unless we think that there's a ligamentous injury or suspicious injuries, then yes, we may do it. Again, trauma, these are a few examples from how the mechanism you guys might have, will definitely have more than us, more experience in these kind of mechanism. But that's very important to know when you come across. So as a radiologist, sometimes the history may not be appropriate uh, where we just say this is the history or even if the history taken is appropriate, but the patient may not be able to talk, his tube, he's intubated, but by the mechanism of injury of trauma, you can even diagnose the mechanism that this is the type of mechanism patient might have had the injury. Okay, are we, are we there with me? Yes, sir, we are with you. Again, this was the neck criteria, so I just put it on. I don't know if you guys need it here, but in FRCR, as or they usually go through in discussion wise, not for details, but that's the way it is. Occipital condition, then these are a few, I know your topic is MRS spine, but these are a few common fractures which are easily missed by us, or and which are very, you have to raise suspicious of such injuries and then cleverly look for. And if we are doing CT scan, then in addition to sagittal and axial slices, we do coronal slices as well and do reform it for them as well in trauma. So if you have any scenario of trauma where you had a CT, C spine or lumbar spine, we do give them CT coronal, CT sag and CT axial images. And these are a few examples of Jefferson, C1, then hangman of C2 fractures. I don't know, I won't go into detail of this. The main theme is I want to keep it to MR and uh, so hangman fractures. Then facet dislocation, very, very important to look for unilateral, bilateral. You guys will be very experienced on these. We hardly see them, but it's very, very, because we don't routinely see them. It's a very easily missed sort of injury where you can see on plain films and then pick it up. That was the, like one of the mechanism where you see hyperextension injury with a subtle fracture of at the base, small like a avulsion fracture, which was taken from C2 anteriorly. And if you want to understand very good concept of these mechanism or even of MRI spine, then write down a website, which is known as Radiology Assistant. 
so radiologyassistance.com or .org i think so so just google that website and just go to the mri neck section or mri spine section it has got very nice detail you don't need to go into detail but your concept will be very clear with how these mechanism correlate with the type of injury you see in your scans okay team are we there till now Are, is any question so far yes yeah, sir it is clear up to now sir again same some variant but again the, you are not going to be asked these coming to that other cord injuries so you can all see here what has happened to the cord cord is all impinged there is all is this like a the whole disc you know if you remember in as and calusing when we talk about like a chance fracture where the whole fracture is gone through the disc so here we are seeing something where the whole disc is almost gone so if you see from the level of c4 and c5 it's all is just like a trans the cord everything is out there so it's a very serious emergency there so again here we can very nicely see it's just like transaction of the cord because i can't even see any con continuation of the cord in this image yeah so again on these sequences if you are given such sequences again look for c2 c3 look at the alignment even on emma sag images look at the cord on this images even on this image other than these injuries at the bottom you can see this disc bulge which is impinging there similarly with the rest of the tiny disc bulge and always correlate those bulges with the axial scans again nerve injuries where we talk about, i don't know if you guys may be shown these kind of injuries or not in even in england we are not shown so much detail about as long as we are the common things are shown commonly and uh, it's just a case of uh, you can see traumatic sort of like what we call traumatic areas of uh, no small like a meningocele like traumatic pseudo meningocele type of changes yeah preculumbar spine again same principle look into the alignment look at the anterior anatomical structures those are the normal common structures which you should be looking for um, and in a preculumbar spines i can go through your anatomy wise your spine if you want i can go through them are you okay there satish yeah? Uh, yeah, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, one question I have. Yeah. Uh, sir, regarding identification of uh, levels of uh, vertebrae, you clearly simplified the identification of lumbar spine. But yes. in case of cervical spine, yes. we I sometimes find this... some difficulty. Yeah. So if you don't have a top part, so the key is the so like a lumbar. I have mentioned about the lumbar. But if you come to the cervical spine, so this is the C, you know, C two vertebrae. If you see this big one, yeah. Yeah. So if if somebody hides this big one and just show me from here, it will be difficult, challenging. Then I will in this image. Then I need to work out whether which level should I be starting. And it's very difficult. Sometimes they might not have been included on the edge of this film. The uh, rib, you know, the ribs when they start from T one. Yeah. So you have to have at least you need this C two. So if you have C two, then this is C two. Then you can work out lower down. And if you have a big lumbosacral region then you can work it out but if it is only center like a thoraco lumbar region then it's very difficult some people will say oh l2 is like a lumb uh, renal artery and that will be the kidneys and this and that but it's again difficult but you in normal practice you should get at least if it is cervical spine it's easy you can start from the top and if the bottom we have already discussed so that how to make sure that you start from one reference point as a both both side the orthoports and the spine surgeon should know that what level you are talking and how to go from lower to home if you can't you can com confidently tell the examiner that in my normal practice i would count from c2 which i'm not seeing in this image or if you are not shown a lumbosacral junction so you can say in my common practice in my normal practice i will look for so that i can give them the accurate levels do you have any more slices or anything and that's the way to handle it yeah so c1 has no vertebra so most yes, proximal vertebra c2. that we see is the c2 one, the first one is this is c2 so i don't know i wish you are seeing my cursor here yes you sir see? we can see yeah so this is c2 so if you see like a pyramid have you seen egyptian you know pyramids or egypt or misr yes. pyramids yes sir yeah oh, yes sir just remember that so it's like a pyramid of sitting there yeah oh and so that's c2 that's it and with atlas we, what you have to that's the atlas that's a, that's the like what we call like c1 c2 junction here wait so that's c1 so you don't take it from there you take from the pyramid the big vertebra here is c2 and that's the way you start oh, okay 
Okay. So again, posterior ligament is complex injury. I don't know if they would show you or not, but if these are the three common structures which you should look for. Like PLL, we talk about, we can look into these intraspinous and spinous, uh, supraspinous and the intraspinous junctions. And again, it's a serious pathology. I don't know if they would show you here and very rare, but it can, it's a serious pathology. We, now this is a CT scan of the same, which then the, so CT in traumatic cases in back home, we always do CT first if it is trauma to look for an acute fractures. And then in our CT reports, we say, we will correlate for soft tissue injuries. You should correlate this with MRI scan. And then we do MRI with collaboration with CT. We give them a combined report. So you can see how much damage here on this scan. This whole thing is open. It's all just like traumatic soft tissue injury through spinous uh, process, uh, between interspinous processes. Okay. These are the spinous processes which you are seeing the big structures here. The common thing is common, which is degenerative changes. So disc dehydration, osteophytosis, and degenerative changes along the facet is what we commonly have scans to report for. And thankfully, where I work, we don't have any, we are not a spine center, so we don't get all those other kinds of things, alhamdulillah. So again, degenerative changes, we talk about modic changes, type 1, type 2, type 3, okay? So these are the common type 1 changes. So how do you look, so how it looks on T1, how it looks on T2, it, and then how it looks on T1, again, T2. So 1, 2, and 3. And you can see the same changes on MRI as well, how they look like, so... Yeah. Again, zones, how do we talk about the nerves? How, when we report them? So if you see, I'll show you the images. If you see, these are the, we should have a common pathology, common uh, nomenclature used. So when I say something, I, I would like to know that my spine surgeon use the same areas to discuss, same areas to talk about. And those are the areas which I will give him in my report. So he knows we are talking into the same areas. I'll show you how it works out, okay? But disc herniation, so if you see it's a normal disc, you are seeing a normal slight bulge there. Usually some studies say it's more than three millimeter. It's very difficult when you have a patient with a pain and symptoms and lying posture wise, body habitus wise, that you get accurate measurements from around the circle of the disc. But that's a normal, if with this kind of minimal bulge, I won't even comment on it. It's variation there will happen. But then when you start seeing bulge like this, that's where you say diffuse bulge. So few words you have to come across when you report spine. One is to have a diffuse bulge, which goes all the circumference of the vertebral body. Then you have an asymmetrical sort of diffuse bulge, which is more centered toward one of the side, which you can see in this third bottom diagram. And then when it comes to nomenclature, so this is another now thing. So one was the diffuse bulge. Then we come to focal bulge. So the neck, so this is like a focal bulging of the disc. That's a normal drawing of a disc. And then the annulus pulpose inside is coming, trying to come, nucleus pulpose is trying to come out from here. So it's a focal bulge or profusion. So this is what profusion is called, which has got a narrow neck. If it is broad neck, it's a diffuse bulge because it's going all the way. And then same is with, so this is protrusion. Then you come with extrusion, which what has happened now. So if you see on axial, that's the way it happens. So it's the focal, narrow neck and it's protruded all into the center of the canal. If you see the same image on the side, you will see it like this popping into the canal. So we call this as extrusion of the disc, that this is extruded into the canal. And then the third category is the sequestration. So just like the sequestration we talk about, you know, sequestrium and involucrium. So that kind of hair, you see you, there's no continuation of the disc. So that is known as sequestrate disc. So these are the three different other nomenclature or morphology of the disc, which you will see in normal practice. So diffuse bulge, focal or local protrusion. <coughs> is it clear now, yeah? Yes, sir, clear. This is another example of where you would see like when we talked about normal disc. So these are the slight bulging discs. So this, this whole margin is the disc. Okay. And then here you can see that has slightly protruded into the, this is the lateral recess. And then it has, it's coming all there. So it's trying to bulge out like the first image, which I showed. This is like a diffuse mild bulge. But on this series, I'm not seeing it if it is causing any impingement or even not even upperting the nerves here. So the nerves are clear. There's enough CSF space 
between the disc and this area. But then I have to cross-reference this with my sagittal image to make sure that this neural foramina is not narrow enough. So always just like in orthopedics, we say we should have two views. Similarly, we should have at least axial and sag in spine to correlate and cross-reference. Examiner may show you a sagittal image and you may see a disc protrusion in sagittal image. Even if you are confident to say it looks like it's compressing the cord and this is a cord compression, but for exam purpose and to achieve good number, you should tell the examiner, I will cross-reference this with axial slices. And that's the completion. So you have told him about the, the sagittal and then told him as well that I will look into the axial to make sure I'm, what I'm saying is to confirm my findings. So then examiner can't trick you or can't challenge you saying, okay, are you sure this is cord compression or are you sure this is this? You will say, no, I will look into the other images. This, this is another case of this protrusion, which you can see now. So it's gone into the canal. In the previous image, you can see nice CSF spaces, which is very clear, enough space there for the nerve to breathe. Here you can see the whole disc, which is causing anterior thecal sac irritation and stenosis or narrowing of the canal. If you don't want to get confused, you can say narrowing of the canal. That's it. Look at these nerves. So these are the nerves which are going down. So they are going down. So the down going nerves are traversing nerves. And the nerves which comes out of that level. So these are the nerves which are coming out on this level on the side. These are the exiting nerves. So two, one nerve on each side will go out. And two nerves with the rest of the other nerves will go down. So the down nerves are known as the traversing nerves. And that's very important to tell the surgeon which nerve at which level is being compromised. And you will do that when you have the SAG to cross-reference this finding. And here, as I said earlier, if you see that's the one of the nerves which is going down, here you can see impingement of the nerve. <coughs> Are you okay there? The canal is narrow. And then on the right side, we can see that there is impingement of the nerve. The same is the case now, if you see, there's a big disc which is sitting all the way within the canal, and then you have to cross-reference to make sure there's no detachment from that neck from the parent or the donor side where the nerve disc is being extruded into the canal. If there is no communication, it's known as sequestered disc. If it is communicating, it's an extruded disc. And then in imaging, you can even give them levels. So I'll come back to just to clarify that. So if you see here on this image, this disc is bulging cordially. So if it is, so you have two cranial. So if it is, you, I've not seen any going cranially, but it can. It's a soft tissue gooey like a toothpaste and it can go up. So if it's going up, this disc extruded, you'd say it's cranially extruded disc. Or if it is going down, you can say it's cordially extruded disc. Sometimes I give them the level as well that is going almost this much level into the canal sort of. Are both okay till here? Yes, yeah, sir, it is okay. Uh, so again, this uh, one, question, one question, yeah. if you don't mind. Please. Uh, sir, uh, we know that there are uh, three uh, basic types of disc herniation. One is central, then paracentral, and far lateral. So yeah. how we can differentiate them on MRI, sir? So look here. So. The, I, there's another image. If you, when you go to that radiology assistant website, it has got nice diagram to explain that. But I'll teach you on this image if you can see this image with my arrow. So that's the central zone, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Side to this is paracentral. So anything to both sides will be paracentral. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then if it goes into this canal, which is the neural foramina, you can check this by the sagittal image where it's going into the foramina. So you can call them foraminal, some say subarticular, some say foraminal, but that's the foramina where you can say it's from foramina. And if it is far lateral, if it goes all the way far lateral, then it's known as extra foraminal or far lateral. But the common ones are the ones which are either central, which is this, or paracentral or lateral recess. So these, this is the lateral recess. This triangular small area where I'm drawing now is the lateral recess on both sides. This, this, this arrow is pointing to lateral recess. And these are the two nerves which are going down, the traversing nerves. And that's where if you get impingement, that's where you can say it's paracentral or, or it is along the lateral recess on axial. 
it will be difficult on sagittal to confirm but on sagittal then you will look for the foramen also as well so you can look the foramen i'll show you if i have the let us go back so i can so just on so here what you are seeing now so that's the neural foramina that's your nerve yeah in the center yeah imagine this should be like a keyhole you know the door keyhole handle in fact we have this you know badi purani chabi a keyhole so the lock door lock ke andar jo chabi dalte hain it should be like that like a keyhole and with aging with dehydration of the disc and with dehydration if you see this facet joint is quite dehydrated there's lots of degenerate arthrosis of facet joint and if you see this canal it's compromising that canal so when this nerve comes out through the foramina you will see that it may be impinging and this is static image i usually report that if i see them abutting or sitting close to the area i say in my report that it's abutting the nerve but remember that the patient is not dynamic he's just lying in the scanner if the patient same patient starts standing and walking he will have impingement is it clear now uh, sadish yes that is clear sadish yes sir go back to the picture yeah okay so all you guys this is an exam question so what 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 is this is it a t1 t2 or a fat suppressed one So you can see fat, but you can't see fluid. What do you think it is? So it is a T one image. It's simple, isn't it? We 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 know yeah, that. You need to know what it is and what type of image it is, isn't it? You can't yeah, see it. Yes, sir. The the, the, the yeah. fluid is not there. So the fluid is not the uh, fluid around the canal. Yes, sir. There is none in the disc, right? But you can see a fat very bright. So it has to be a T one because if it was a stir, then you wouldn't see this fat. Then isn't it? Yeah. yeah, sir. Good, good. Sorry to interrupt you. Yes, sir. Always welcome. Always needed, sir. Yeah. So just while Shakir is doing this, he was my first trainee from Pakistan. <laughs> my oh, first trainee. Golden days, sir. Normally, I get them from UK, but he was my first trainee from Pakistan. Yeah. Good. So right sir now coming to this canal stenosis so again it, i i have already touched this on the previous slide so here you can just this is much easier to understand so if you see here the canal so i told you that look at the space how spacious this canal is and remember it's not just the disc which can compromise the nerve roots it can be this ligamentum flavum which we, which is thickened so if you have a big thickened ligamentum flavum which can compromise it's like a closed space it's like a room or space So the more you have more stuff in the room, the more this will be tight. So you can have compromise from ligamentum even thickening. You can have facet joint arthrosis, which can cause osteophytosis, cyst even as well, which can compromise. And then you can have disc, which in itself can compromise this whole triangular sort of nice neat space. And that's where then you talk about whether is there narrowing of the canal, is it moderate, severe, or that that kind of thing. we usually don't go with practice we talk about moderate severe we don't do any canal measurements there are some very posh radiologists back home who may give them some diameters and dimension and there are there are some classification we don't go into that we just give them what we see as mild moderate and severe then here is the model of where you have seen the herniated sort of disc but we still can see quite a lot of csf spaces there and you can see these nice nerve roots coming up all the way and here you can see now so see the difference so if you see the first image you have got this bundle of nerve roots which are coming down with enough space for the nerve to breathe which is whereas here now there's a large disc there and this very narrow space so that's known as like a spinal canal stenosis or very limited space for the nerve roots to go and it will impinge there so now coming to the spinal max so again very important is to look for t1 t2 and stir so you have to so if they challenge you in exam that is it we are suspecting tumor or clinical scenario is something to do with tumor always add a stir sequence to it you have to add a stir sequence to it so again these are three images so again stir spinal max can be two types lytic sclerotic or even mixed sometime the key to remember is bulging of the posterior cortex just like in the trauma ct scans we say retropulse fragment is sitting or not similarly imagine is it bulging of the posterior cortex is there any extra osseous component with the lesion 
and is there any involvement of the paticle? Paticle is the key where it will go and decimate an area where it starts. And I think so it's to do with the blood supply. The more nourished the blood, the paticle is, the more blood uh, the metastasis goes there. That's what my, my thinking. I don't know if Mr. Shah can add to that. That's what I thought or remember from my orthopedic days. So spinal metastasis is here. So as you can see now, again, coming to the sequences, Wise, let us check. So that's the T2 sequence where you see the CSF. Is that correct? Yeah, team. Then we have T1 sequence in the center where the CSF is dark. And this is, I think, so another T1, or they have done some form of trim or sequence where you can see. So I'll explain it to you. So T1, always remember, T1 low signal lesion is always suspicious. So anything which is low on T1, and if there's history of metastasis or past history of cancer, you have to raise suspicious, and then you cross-reference that with T2. If you don't have a T2, look into the stir sequence where if it is bright lighting up, it's highly suspicious for metastasis. Is this clear now, Satosh? Uh, yes, yeah, sir, it is clear. The same is look at this now. So how big is the abnormality? Where it is started? You need an axial now to look for whether how far lateral this is starting and going up to. Yeah. So we can see nice CSF space, white is, so it's like a T2 where you can see nice CSF, but then look for the fat, is the fat, how emaciated this patient is. In the previous degenerative scans, you could see lots of fat. Here you are hardly seeing any fat. It's like a thin sliver of fat, which is suppressed there. Then it will make it a stir sequence for me. Same is here with T1, where you can see CSF is dark and it's a T1 sequence. So you can see the abnormality, you can see the vertebra, which is being abnormal or change and this large extra osseous component. So this is that kind of extra osseous component, which may have some roots to the adjacent particle where it might have been coming and compromising the canal. But then you have to look into the axial to make sure how far deep it is going. So another example is, which they may ask you is about insufficiency versus pathological. And this is the case where I talked about, if you see that's the vertebra, which is suspicious or involved, you can see a bulge of the vertebra here. So on T1, it will be low. So anything low on T1 is suspicious. It's a, something sinister. You should raise suspicious. Then you go and cross-reference it with T2. If not, T stir is the key to rescue you here, which is this you can see here. And I said, normally in metastasis, even we don't give contrast. I didn't know they give here and they ask you, but we don't practice to give metastasis. Spine metastasis to good contrast. No, we just do T1, T2, and stir sequences with axials. Another example, so that was pathological where you can see the bulge. Here, what you are seeing is like what we call insufficiency or like osteoporotic site or sort of fracture where there's wedging of the whole entire vertebra. So here and plate is just like sitting on the top of it. But you're not seeing any retropulse fragment or any retropulse uh, segment to it where you can then raise suspicious and then again in normal practice if you see something which you think could be long-standing always say that i will look into previous imaging if there's any previous imaging because that will help you that this could be in this case if it is bright on stir then it means it could be acute on chronic fracture or it is acute fracture because there is bright signal on stir if you have a fracture on t1 and then it is not bright on stir it means it's old fracture or it was a fracture, but there's no acute component to it. Next is infection like spondylodiscitis. Discitis starts at the vertebral and plate, involves the disc, look for sign of inflammation and paraspinal pathologies. So again, in these cases, you have to always raise suspicious. In this case, the rescue will be look for inflammatory markers. You have to ask the team, how is the patient? So any search cases where the team will help you and guide you. They will raise suspicious as orthopods. They help us, they tell us, okay, this is what to do. This is the scenario. And then otherwise, usually you will not look for activity. And that's the reason that people do miss discitis. Again, this was a video of it, which I have tried to see if it is working. So you can see the abnormal level here. So again, just for the sake of the same principles, we can see the near complete disc is at this level, which is L5 and S1 for my reporting. And then between L4 and L5, I can see. So bright signal in the disc is which should make you suspicious. Fluid signal in the disc is always to raise suspicious. 
and then you look into the marrow that is the marrow or the vertebral end plate is what's happening here but if in this case what i'm thinking what you sometimes can get what they call like a shermal node so it could be possible that the patient might have a old shermal node where then the infection has started not because of the node it just felt so you have like the shermal nodes are uh, intervertebral herniation of the discs but then if patient get on top infection in that disc just by nature or by allah then that will just light up usually i don't see it such light lit up with some fluid so if it is showing you that is more than high signal then the comparing comparing to the other disc you have to raise suspicious look for erosion around the disc look for edema around the vertebral end plates so, and in this case we have got lots of something is already going into the posterior so if you see there there is quite a lot of like a epidural small collection or abscess which you are seeing this high fluid this should be there and that's not a normal volume for a disc we still have enough of stuff in here and there's still a lot in the canal if you see and if you had an axial on this slide you would have then talked about the axial that and it's a serious pathology where you have to pick up the phone and inform the clinician and team most of the time we search cases we are already told that they are either ibu drug abusers or immunocompromised or they they are not well and they are see these way that in back pain you x the x ray them is very difficult sometime to pick up on uh, x ray the early changes but then mr is the answer where you will not just look for any high signal in the disc you will look for any marrow edema anything into the vertebral and plates adjacently then in tb cases i remember is where usually we don't see them luckily back home there but here in tb cases the subligamentous spread is very very important to look for to see there is no lifting of any pus or anything is lifting the anterior longitudinal ligament and is going all the way across like what we call subligamentous so on side subligamentous collection or is the area to look for in tuberculosis cases but in this one uh, you can give a differential of i don't know in here they will ask you or not but in real practice we will start them on antibiotics refer it to the office they'll be under infection control as well as the spine team and if they want to go and wash it and clean it they will do that for the patient and send sample and sampling at the same time any question are we okay so far yes sir it is okay okay good so the next case is which you might have formed uh, how how will we differentiate the disc herniation from the infection if the both the disc so is, history uh, is the key. Dehydrate. history is the key and in herniation patient should not get usually in herniation the one which i have seen you you see lots of tiny it's like multiple levels and the in discitis cases patient will have history of infection or history sorry history of being unwell and fever history of crp raised team team has got concern they have examined the patient and that's the way it will be but this is like one of sort of scenario where i am thinking that because this speech looks like more as a long standing rather than erosion which i can think of but again because of the high signal changes i would raise it as discitis rather than playing it low saying there's normal notes and i'll ignore it is it okay yeah okay sir against spondylolisthesis thesis you all may know about this par interarticularis which we area which again if there is just a fracture of that area there is spondylolisthesis happening and when it have spondylolisthesis then it goes above and usually if i am reporting and we see is it anterior anterior listhesis or anterior spondylolisthesis as the common mechanism you all may know we be knowing these grades in my practice we normally if you see them we explain to them they don't ask about grades we tell them it's minor mild it's like grade 1 or grade 2 depending on the percentage how much it is gone um for the spine surgeon i don't know if in routine practice they ask here or not and there's the basic concept of what they call like a scotty dog so if you see normally on x ray you will see like a small dog if you see or whatever they call a scott dog sort of like that's what it should be normally but if the neck is broken of the dog that's where you get this spondylolysis and uh, spondylolisthesis and x ray is a good example where you picking up like here we have tried to see if we can make up the neck of the dog so if you see that's the dog and here we are not seeing anything is it clear there yeah, i don't know if it calls out the dog is wearing a collar all oh, right okay yeah, so if you're wearing a collar that means it's got a fracture in it okay good to know 
Okay, yeah, that's fine. I think so. That's all I could do in, in the last two days. I managed to find whatever I could. Um, any question, I'm more than welcome to open any questions or anything sir, to add or... Uh, yes, sir. I, I have one question, sir. Please. Uh, sir, a few days uh, back, we had a rehearsal of our exam. Yeah. Uh, in which we got a station. There was a, uh, actually MRI of cervical spine. Uh, which we appreciated as uh, showing the listesis of C5 or C6. Okay. So we all candidates answer the diagnosis as spondylolisthesis, but uh, in the end, the examiner said the diagnosis was facet joint dislocation actually. Okay. So we are uh, not clear how to differentiate between these two facet joint dislocation and listesis. Let me see if I can. Dr. Shah can take you over from here, but I'm still online. I'm going to show you an image of that if I can find some on radiology assistant. So, uh, the, the thing to remember is that uh, in, in this thesis and in, in facet joint dislocation, they both will have a history of trauma. Okay. However, yeah. uh, um, it is very uncommon to have it bilateral. It is, you know, the, the facet joint dislocation is always unilateral. Okay. And in listesis, it is a long-standing process. So in listesis, the history will be long, and also there will be some chronic changes on your MRI scan or a CT scan, whichever you want to see that. So, so it is it is mostly uh, um, history and examination and stuff like that, and be aware of it. Uh, but but uh, normally there is uh, not much different between the two. So uh, it is unfair to say that that was listesis and this was 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 facet dislocation. Saying that, I have not seen many listesis in the neck, but I've seen quite a lot of facet dislocations in the neck. So that's another thing that can help you. Yeah, clear. Thank you, sir. It is not common. It is not common to have listesis in the neck. It is quite common to have listesis in the thoracolumbar spine, but not in the cervical spine. So unless proven otherwise, it has to be a facet dislocation. Yeah. Okay, sir. I, uh, Dr. Mr. Shah, how to, sir, I should put this uh, internet okay. page on. If I just go into the share. Go to stop share. So go to my screen, click on my yeah, screen. Or... Screen say stop share. Do you want me to do it for you? Oh, please, sir, if you can do it, sir, you can. Uh, have you got it minimized into the bottom of your screen, yeah? Yeah, internet explorer is minimized, yeah. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So should I stop share? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Now bring it on. Put it on. Now page. if I start share, it yeah. will ask. Yeah. yeah. Are we? Can any yeah, everyone? Can you see this? So this this is the website which I was talking about. If you just go through this for your exam over the next few days, you will have a very clear understanding of how these spinal cervical injuries are shown in exam and how, what's the mechanism. It's very, very informative website for educational purposes. And when the question to, back to your question, coming to the mechanism in unilateral. I think Chakra, it, it is agreed that we don't see listesis in in cervical spine as common as... Yeah, I've never come across. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's what I'm saying. You see, it can't be a disease. It has to be a facet joint dislocation. Other until proved other, I agree, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's what here, if you see, the, and again, to do that, usually it's picked, if I see a normal scenario, it's usually this X-ray scan with a history of trauma and an X-ray, which will then make us suspicious, where then we will go for a CT first, in normal practice. And then it should be, so that's the way it should be shown, but I don't know, obviously here the practice mechanism will be different for exam, sorry. They may be directly shown. So we only do it when you see, and if you see these changes, this can't be, on, you are not going to call this uh, on this MR. If I, uh, can you see this guys? Yes, yeah, sir, we can see. Yes, I mean, in, so if you see this, this can't, this is not going to be spondylitis thesis type of things. So if you see the whole vertebrae is not the alignment in its first principle. So this is the pyramid is the C2. Yeah, and you can see that whole alignment is distorted. And the moment yeah. I start, start seeing this alignment distortion, look at the posterior distortion, look at the cord in itself, there are white signal changes in the cord. So there's the myelomalisic or traumatic changes. Look at the soft tissue, if you this, see this bright signal, 
look at the soft tissue and if you further scroll it look at the facet this is bone this is bone it's not it's just perch it's just like on the edge of the other is sitting next to it if you see it's a, this can't be i won't be calling it or in normal practice the, what you can do then if you are shown mr the other practicing thing is have a low put it at the lowest level that at spondylolisthesis type features but then look for the soft tissue surrounding look for the cord changes if you see lots of other secondary signs of traumatic event then it's more to do with facet joint rather than spondylolisthesis sort of one. is that correct the, the thing to remember from here is that spondylolisthesis is a long standing process it doesn't happen with one single trauma okay there's yeah. a lot of soft tissues holding everything so it takes slowly and it only goes in one direction okay whereas a facet dislocation if it's uni it will rotate which means it'll look on both sides and if it's both then it would it can do retro forward and then when you do the the the, the t2 images or the stair sequences you will know there's edema all around it that soft tissue injuries edema yeah and finally uh, I have not seen a, a listasis in the cervical spine. I'm not seeing one, so I'm not sure if it's common enough to have it. Yeah. So I'm taking okay. it's a percent joint dislocation. Oh, yeah. I clear. But this is a good website, as I said. You have a look. And uh, any questions, anything else, guys? Uh, yes, sir. If you don't mind, I want to ask a last question. Please, yeah. So regarding uh, infections of the spine, we have two uh, most more common infection. One is pyogenic, second is tuberculosis. So yeah. how we can differentiate between two on the MRI? I think so the key here is what I said is subligamentous spread is what they all, we luckily touch wood. For example, because I have seen TB cases, but and not never asked, but we don't see it, we don't see it commonly. Uh, it may be happening, I don't know, some uh, regional areas may have some more tendency of it, but with tuberculosis, it's, remember, it will be subligamentous spread of the infection, which goes un, uh, uh, under the ligament. With sores or with other abscesses, you will see large collection of abscess and pus and pocket of something. And that's another thing, one, one of the key things to look for. Let me see if I can find you something to show you. And yeah, you can so my take on this is, that in tuberculous infection, it is coming from the vertebrae, whereas uh, all these other infections, they are coming either from the disc or from outside. So the, the appearances on the MRI scan and the collection is totally different. Plus the symptoms are totally different. Clinically, it's quite different. Yeah, that's true. Symptom-wise, yeah. it's no, there, there was a I think so there was a, let me how to, let me, okay. I'm trying to hold this top bar to bring it to side so I can bring, show you something on it. So you then it's more convincing for us. Go ahead. Do you like the experience? Okay. It, it, you can do everything you want on this talk, isn't it? Sorry? You can add anything. You can show PowerPoint. You can show uh, images from your desk. You can talk. You can go into the internet. It's an amazing. Yes, very good. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Second. Well, Shahid Noor uh, spoke to us a few days ago and he said it was brilliant. He was sitting at home having a cup of tea, looking at the cricket game and also doing a talk like it. And yeah, Marshall. Who was this? Sorry? I knew. Oh, Shahid Noor, okay, yeah, that's good. He was the POA president, but he is the Arthroplasty Society president. So he talked to us yeah, no, I know him. So, in, I think so in 2008, I came, I don't know if you remember, I came to Pakistan to present some papers, and then he was the one who gave me the, what's it called, um, some certificate. So, I saw my pictures with him shaking hand many years ago. Yes, yes. I didn't tell you, isn't it, that, that Shakir was my first trainee in Pakistan. So, that's why he's important. Good, sir. Nice. I'm just seeing if I can show them something. Um, but he got corrupted. He didn't want to do TNO. He went into a branch of TNO to do musculoskeletal radiology like isn't it? Mas but that was the only reason I can go to Wrightington, sir. Otherwise, orthopedic, you know what is happening in England with orthopedic. It's very difficult, sir, to get a run through number. And very, very, I don't know if you remember, Shakir Hussain got a number. He's now, he's done his exam last month, a few months All ago. Right. I don't, uh, can you see this uh, or should I come to share again? Yeah. You were seeing whatever you were showing us. Yeah. That's a nice topic for a uh, team. Uh, if they want to have a quick read, it's just like a quick, what is source muscle abscess? And then they can differentiate. They will give you all the difference so that where you will see it in diabetes, AIDS, renal failure, secondary infections, and 
and then the results of they may also have the neighboring swan dialo discitis and then you can click on this and read about it and at the bottom of this page is all to do with the mri scans and uh, how they look like on mri so See, see, guys, let's not forget we're all clinicians besides looking at x rays. So the history will be totally different between the acute infection yeah. and the TB patient. So if you get stuck and you don't know what to say on the x rays or MRI scan, just say, well, I'll take a proper history and that will guide me whether this infection is I I infective or is it tuberculous, I should say. Yeah, that's true. But in fact, in fairness, that is very true for being a real life clinician in Pakistan. Yesterday, me, me being a musculoskeletal radiologist had seen a patient with no referral with the ankle injuries and knee OAs yesterday, sir. Directly. Yes, sir. You are big people, you have a 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 big people, you ठीक है सर एनीथिंग एल्स टीम एनीथिंग सर थैंक थैंक यू एडवर्ट यू हैव कवर्ड अलमोस्ट एवरीथिंग सो बंडल ऑफ थैंक्स नो प्रॉब्लम थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू एवरीवन सर थैंक यू वेरी मच सर फॉर दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी इंशाल्लाह थैंक यू सारे फॉर जॉइनिंग अस इनो वी शाकर इज वेरी क्लोज टू मी एंड आई हैव लॉट्स ऑफ सॉफ्ट कोना फॉर हिम एनीवे बट आई एम इवन मोर ग्रेटफुल नाउ दैट ही केम इन एंड टॉक नो सर ऑलवेज Always welcome, sir. Always welcome. Many times. I'm going to close this meeting and I'll uh, post the video on the forum for everybody to see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Shaka. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, everyone. Have a good time, Jazakallah. Good luck with your exams, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, thank you, sir.